Okay, I'm excited. One of my favorite topics to talk about is genetic engineering and biotechnology. Y'all, there's so much we could get into on this, and so I'm going to just give a broad overview, and then we're going to spend more time in class doing a research and report where we'll look into more of the applications and implications of um, this topic. So just know that I'm doing like skyscraper view of this. I'm not sure if that's the right term, phrase of speech, but here we go. So biotechnology is referring to any technology that's used to change the genetic makeup of living things to make products. If you remember from Unit 1 Biology Basics, we learned that technology is the application of scientific and engineering principles to solve problems. So this is just saying we're going to change the genetics of a living thing in order to solve problems with products and processes. And so this is referring to how we make antibiotics, vaccines, synthetic hormones, um, biofuels, which is fuels out of living things, food production. There's so much that goes into this. Now, genetic engineering is specifically that direct manipulation of an organism's genome using biotechnology. So they, they're related and they kind of go hand in hand. So we're specific, we're going to replace specific genes in an organism in order to ensure that that organism is going to express a desired trait. So whatever it is we want them to express, whether that's fixing something that's wrong or replacing something that's missing, something like that. And we couldn't do this without recombinant DNA. So recombinant DNA is artificially made DNA from two or more different sources. And we can only make this and then use it to place specific genes in an organism because we know where genes are located on specific chromosomes. So how can we do this? It starts with understanding the human genome. A genome is just an organism's complete set of DNA. It's all of its genes. And the Human Genome Project was the first complete map of a human's entire genome. And it was completed in 2003. We learned so much from it. We learned that human DNA has 3 billion base pairs and approximately 21,000 genes that code for proteins. And even more fascinating is we learned that only about 1.5% of your DNA is, is actually coding for proteins. So even though 21,000 genes seems like a lot, it's not considering how much DNA you have. So much of your DNA is just repetitive sequences, which we're not exactly sure what those are used for in their entirety, but then also some sequences that are more regulatory, which is fascinating. We also found out that we share about 99% of our human genome with other humans, which is pretty cool too. I also have a ton of videos relevant to each of these slides, so we'll be looking at some of those later. But that's not the only project that was used to map the human genome. There's the ENCODE project also. This was launched as a follow-up to the Human Genome Project. I'll fix that typo right there. Um, and it was used to interpret the sequence determined from HGP. And then there's also the Thousand Genomes Project. This was an even more detailed genome map sequencing over a thousand different people from a variety of ethnic backgrounds, and it was completed in 2015. So we're constantly investigating the genome. And again, I mentioned gene maps. This is just showing the location of genes on chromosomes. We can't manipulate our genes if we don't know where they are. So these gene maps that have resulted from these projects are critical for doing that. So what's actually happening? Again, this is very complex stuff, so I'm going to simplify it as best I can. The simplest way I can explain it is with restriction enzymes. These are enzymes that cut your DNA at specific locations called restriction sites. And they create these fragments of DNA that have these little sticky ends. You can see kind of where they're sticking out. That allows them to be joined with other DNA fragments by the enzyme DNA ligase, which you may remember we mentioned when we learned about DNA replication. And this creates recombinant DNA. So let's say we have a circular piece of DNA here. This would be called a plasmid. And then we have some other DNA from a different organism here. We could use restriction enzymes to cut a hole in the plasmid, put in this fragment of DNA that we've cut up here too with the restriction enzymes and insert it. And now we have new DNA that we can insert into an organism and start transcribing and translating it into the proteins that we want to be made. Another um, 
process that's really important for us to be able to manipulate genes is the polymerase chain reaction, or PCR. This is a technique that allows you to copy a piece of DNA without a cell. To make a ton of copies of it, it's also known as DNA amplification. And basically, it makes it possible we could take a really small sequence of DNA and make a ton of copies of it in a test tube, which is pretty cool. Another thing that makes this possible is gel electrophoresis. This is a lab method that uses an electric current to separate your DNA fragments based on their molecular um, size. And this is really useful for DNA fingerprinting or identifying organisms by their DNA. So your DNA fragments, because of the phosphate groups in them, they have this slightly negative charge. And so when we turn this current on, the DNA fragments kind of stretch out because they're attracted to the positive end of the gel. So you put um, your samples in one end on the negative side, and then when the current's turned on, they are attracted and they're pulled across. And smaller, far smaller fragments can move faster and farther than larger ones. And so that's how they make kind of these banding patterns that then we can compare. So we can compare the DNA sample from this first well to the second and the third. Um, which is pretty cool. So we use these techniques, again, to do genetic engineering, which is manipulating genes in an organism to get desired traits. And there are tons of examples of genetic engineering and ways that biotechnology can be applied and used so that society benefits as a whole. I'm just going to give you a couple of examples um, here that I'm, again, just going to briefly mention. So personal genome sequencing. This is using DNA sequencing technologies to have your personal genome sequenced. If you want to know what your gene said, we can do that. Um, it provides information about your physiology and your susceptibility to certain diseases. And it could be really useful, especially for couples who carry genes for genetic disorders and are trying to reproduce via IVF or in vitro fertilization. Because if we could sequence your genomes, then we can make sure when we were implanting an embryo via in vitro that it didn't have the genes that, had, that were affected with a certain genetic disorder or something like that. Um, fun fact, Steve Jobs, who is the co-founder of Apple, was one of the very first 20 people in the entire world to have his personal genome sequenced. And at the time, it cost him about $100,000. As of 2016, it cost about $1,000 to sequence your genome. And I'm not really sure how much it costs now. Thousands a lot better than 100000 though. All right, cloning. This is a sheep, because if you did not know, the very first cloned organism was a sheep named Dolly. And gene cloning is producing multiple identical copies of a gene. And this is possible because of transformation. It's a process of inserting recombinant DNA into host cells. And then those replicate over and over again. Um, so we can insert recombinant DNA into bacteria plasmids, those circular DNAs I showed a couple slides ago. And then when that bacteria reproduces, which it does really frequently, because that's what bacteria do, it makes millions and millions of cells all with that cloned gene. And I think this is important to note, gene cloning is not necessarily always an entire organism. That's important. So bacterial transformation, a great example of this is um, with humulin, which is a synthetic insulin. So you don't need to write this if you're my class, but insulin is a protein that's made by your pancreas and it regulates your blood sugar, which is really important. If you have type 1 diabetes, you don't make enough insulin or some people don't make any insulin. So in order to have their blood sugar regulated, they have to inject it. And this is how we've, made, we've used bacterial transformation to make humulin, which is an artificial drug of insulin, and um, bacterial transformation has done it. So we've taken a piece of circular DNA called a plasmid, um, extracted from bacteria, restriction enzymes cut out a piece, and then the gene for human insulin was inserted and those fragments were stuck together with ligase. And then now we have this genetically modified plasmid that has the DNA for making human insulin. And it's in a new bacteria cell, which replicates a lot. So that cell starts rapidly dividing and starts making a ton of insulin. And then that insulin can be filtered out, it can be purified, it can be packaged into bottles, and then insulin pins can be distributed to patients for use, which is pretty cool. So gene therapy is related to this. It's this idea of inserting a normal gene or editing an existing gene to fix an absent or abnormal gene. Um, 
CRISPR is a gene editing technique that helps us understand the genetics behind many diseases. And here's a picture of CRISPR here. It doesn't um, just introduce normal genes. It's actually going in and repairing existing abnormal genes, which is pretty awesome. And I have some great video clips to show you about that. Stem cells, we mentioned these in unit two, but these are undifferentiated cells that have the potential to become anything at all. We mainly find them in embryos, but they could also be found in adult bone marrow. And these are really um, important for genetic engineering because we can genetically manipulate them and then introduce them to replace tissue that's deficient or damaged due to a disease, which is pretty awesome. Now, if you're listening to all this and you're like, I don't like any of this, I don't want anything to do with it. Well, most likely you have something to do with it because of selective breeding. This is the artificial breeding of organisms with a desired trait. And pretty much all domesticated animals are selectively bred. And um, a lot of the foods you eat probably are too. This is how farm animals are made. And I specifically spelled it that way because farming is producing pharmaceuticals in farm animals or plants. So specifically breeding certain animals that are able to have certain things in them. That's like the simplest way I can explain it. So for example, we're going to genetically modify something so that its DNA makes it resistant to pesticides, makes it produce more, makes it have a longer shelf life, and makes it resistant to drought, resistant to drought that kind of thing. So GMOs are just organisms altered by recombinant DNA technology so that we get desired traits over and over again. Um, most likely, if you've eaten anything with corn, soy, um, canola oil in it, or if you're wearing anything made out of cotton, you're interacting, having eaten or wearing something that's genetically modified. So it's not always um, a bad thing, and it's not necessarily just, it's just not necessarily negative, as it has that connotation for so many. Also, again, like I said, if you've got a dog or a cat in your house, it's probably the result of selective breeding. Um because we're specifically breeding certain animals to get certain other animals and certain traits. Um, like a Labradoodle is specifically breeding a Labrador Retriever with a Poodle to get this certain trait. If you know, like a hypoallergenic, most likely not shedding type of dog. One um, bummer of selective breeding is often inbreeding can happen, which is where we cross individuals that are closely related and it can result in some health problems. Like for instance, Labrador Retrievers are often if a breeder is breeding them, they can often be really um, inbred and it can cause some issues like with their joints and things like that as they get older. One type of selective breeding is also hybridization. It's specifically relates breeding unrelated organisms. Now, we're not saying you can just make a bird and a dog reproduce. That's not going to happen. Their genomes are too different. But organisms that are different species but that have close enough genomes that they could reproduce, this is possible. Um, and an example of this is something I pictured here called a liger, which is a lion and a tiger combo. Now, as you can see, the resulting offspring is often a hardier mix of the two um, parents, which is pretty cool. Now, this affects society in so many ways. There are so many implications, both positive and negative, that I want you to consider um, as we investigate biotechnology more in our research and report activity. But, I mean, some positives are we're able to better diagnose and treat diseases and hopefully eventually prevent them too. We can alter affected genes through gene therapy. We can produce pharmaceuticals and farm animals and plants that help um, cure diseases and do a ton of stuff for us health-wise. We can use microorganisms for environmental cleanup. There are forensic applications, um, just agriculture in general. There's so, so much that they can be used for. And we're going to now investigate that more in class. So... No, that was a quick overview, but I hope it piqued your interest, and I'm excited to talk to you more about it in class.